So I have a I have an empirical question and then a, a theoretical question. So in terms of the empirical question, I'm wondering if because I'm more familiar with the Liberian case, yes. I have come to have a very exaggerated sense of the significance of um, remittances for the economy. Yes. yes. Because when you were lining it up first, yes. you put it under the social. Because it goes into households and it's you know a very very important source of support for mm -hmm. households. But that in the at least in the librarian context, it also is um, an incredible portion of the economy as a whole, and so yes. therefore really significant. So is that is that yes. consistent across yeah, it is. this? Yeah. Okay. So then why did you why did you choose to put it um, in just the lower category rather than? in all three of Europe. Well, because I'm thinking, where do the remittances go to? Okay, the remittances so go don't first? go to business. Uh, well, they might go to household-based businesses, but essentially people send remittances back to their families mm -hmm. uh, uh, and to enable their families then to invest in businesses and produce more. But the first, the point of entry is really with people's families. So that's why I put it in the sphere of social reproduction. Then it may, you know, then it's spill over into production if people um, can use some of that money to invest in their in their businesses and produce more. Uh, that was the reason I put it there. Yeah. And then the, the second, which um, is more of a comment, is um, about the the typology of the high income, middle income, and low income. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and I'm thinking in particular again of Liberia and yes. the other. Just the general finding that there are a significant portion of low income states that are not actually functioning states. Yes. And yep. I'm wondering if um, the people who are in middle income and most low income mm -hmm. are more comparable than the people who are in low income countries and the people who are in more foreign countries. You're, you're right to raise that issue because uh, you've already got huge crises um, in countries that don't have functioning states. Mm -hmm. So. That there's not going to be any kind of coordinated state response in countries that don't have functioning states. So, and uh, and there were lots of uh, maybe in those countries non-governmental organisations have been an important channel <coughs> of, of, of resources entering the country, but they're probably going to be facing cutbacks too. So um, you're absolutely right. There's a diversity among um, low-income countries, and those that don't have functioning states are in an extremely difficult situation. I'll jump in. Some, <coughs> some. I, I guess I have more. Uh, two comments and, and a question. Um, one is putting together your two talks from. Uh, yesterday and today, high income and middle and low income countries, there's really a divergence in terms of um, the issue of employment and, and gender, where you showed us statistics for high income countries where men were harder hit with unemployment than women were, at least so far, in high income countries. Whereas we see, at least from your numbers here, um, which are more scattered, they're not percentage ones, but that we're seeing women being harder hit in lower income countries. Than, than men, I, I think, from, from what we're seeing there. Which is an interesting difference that might tell us, um, might have a broader message in terms of structures of economies and how an export-oriented structured economy um, with particular kinds of exports, uh, export-oriented manufacturing hit being hitting women more, whereas the, the highly service female service sector in advanced industrialized countries may be cushioning those women to a greater degree, even though both are precarious forms of, of employment. Mm -hmm. So that's just a, mm -hmm. a, a comment to, to kind of bring things together and, and maybe to, to, ex, I don't know, to think about how these might fit. Yeah. Um, another comment is, is, I do think that looking into the IMF um, and whether or not it's the same as, a really, as before is an important question, because certainly the World Bank has changed um, fundamentally in, in the last uh, 10 or 15 years in terms of its outlook, mm -hmm. um, much more interested in investing in human capital once again as it once was. So um, and the IMF may be completely different, but I think it's wor it's definitely worth um, some greater empirical investigation. If you have any other ideas on that, I'd like to, I'd like to hear them. And I guess my, so if you wanted to comment on either one of those, and, and my question would be, 
Um, you began both of your talks talking about the importance of intersections of class and race and age and, and so on. And what might be some of the ways that if, um, if either you or, um, or someone else were to take a piece of this work and mm -hmm. go into further depth, mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that you would see that mm -hmm. as being mm -hmm. um, how one would address those yep. issues? No, these are really uh, good comments and uh, questions, I think. Um, I think I'd say, I'd just qualify slightly this sort of idea that maybe it's the men who are losing their jobs more in the rich countries and the mm -hmm. women in the poor countries, because as I said yesterday, that the, um, in the first phase of the recession in the rich countries, yes, it looks like it's definitely been more men losing their jobs, but that's because uh, it hasn't yet uh, gone into a second phase where there's a lot of cutbacks in public expenditure or impact on the, on the, which will impact on the kind of service jobs. So in a year's time, we might find there's actually been a lot of um, um, more impact on women's jobs in the rich countries. That there might be a different time profile. And in the, in the poorer countries, it does depend on what your export sector is like. Mm -hmm. If you've if you're, um, got um, uh, ex export-oriented manufacturing of the kind that's mainly light industry, with garments and uh, electronic assembly, definitely these women are going to be losing their jobs. And we see that in the Southeast Asia region. Um, but, and the export processing zones in, say, Central America. But if, if it's... Um, one way your export sector is mainly mining, but then I think that's going to be where men are losing their, their jobs. Um, uh, I, the only figures I've been able to get so far are this from Zambia, but I've heard you know, I was at a meeting where people were saying, oh yes, um, lots of uh, men have been losing jobs in mining in Africa. So that will depend on the structure of your export sector. So the job loss definitely depends on what's the structure of your economy and where are men and women positioned in, in, in those uh, sectors. Um, um, in terms of the IMF, um, uh, well, I'm fairly confident in saying that they've just not changed in the way that in on gender issues in the terms that the World Bank has, nor, and I don't think they've changed very much on, um, on the kind of conditions they're attaching. If you look at their website compared with the World Bank, you know, you'll find very, very few mentions of gender or women. You look at the kind of what they're supposed to have been doing on, on the uh, impact of their policies on poverty and, and, and social issues. There's very, very little. There's very few people devoted to it. Um, they're just in a completely different um, uh, situation, I think. Um, partly because, in a way, they just don't deal with people. The World Bank's been forced to change because the World Bank deals with the kinds of um, the real economy with production mm -hmm. and where people work and it deals with the real services like um, water and sanitation. And so, so it's come, women's organization been able, as a result of that, to put much more pressure on the World Bank. The entry points, the lobbying points were easier to identify. And there has been huge pressure being put on the World Bank. I think that's why it's changed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wouldn't overestimate. I mean, this is changed in some ways, but not in others. <laughs> um, because there's large chunks of the World Bank that don't really take gender issues seriously either. Uh, but there has been some change in the rhetoric and some change in the amount of money and some concern. Oh, yes, once we used to say that countries should charge fees to send children to primary school and for women uh, to go to hospitals to have babies. Oh, dear, now we've discovered that that's really a bad idea because it means families are less likely to send their girls to school and women are less likely to go and have their uh, babies uh, with uh, skilled uh, care to look after them and even though you try and put in systems that exempt the poorest people it doesn't really work so they have grown back on all of that but because the IMF's link is to the finance sector in the first place and it only talks to the central bank and the ministry of finance and the people in the central bank and the ministry of finance have very often been trained in the same economics departments as the people at the IMF and indeed, in many cases, there are people in the finance ministry and the central bank who spent part of their career as an economist in the IMF. There's very often a shared culture of um, looking at the economy solely through the lens of finance and not through production or reproduction. I think that's very hard to shift. 
that's, that's a harder one uh, to shift. And it's harder to find the entry points because it's not, there aren't so many lobbying points. It's not so easy to figure out how you mobilize um, and what kinds of evidence you bring to bear. And it all seems a lot more kind of technical. And so I, I think that that's, it's, it's, it's harder to do that. But I think um, enabling more women's organizations to kind of understand something about that and try and figure out how do you try and put pressure on your central bank or your Ministry of Finance? How do you try and put pressure on the IMF might be something you need to start thinking uh, much more about? And the, was there one more point that you raised? If you were to um, take a piece of the study and yes. think about intersections yeah. of So if we, if we think about age, um, and indeed uh, it, it, in, it, in London the Overseas Development Institute is about to do a study, I think, with money from UNICEF uh, on looking at issues of uh, youth in the in the economic crisis and doing focus groups and interviews with young people as well and involving young people in collecting the data um, and and in that's the both uh, in uh, an education issue and an employment issue and uh, it particularly young people like to be hit because um, their education being jeopardized and also because they're new entrants to the labor market it's going to be harder for them to certainly get in the formal kinds of employment and so um, as we see in the USA and the UK young people are particularly vulnerable to unemployment and uh, in, in developing countries young people are going to be particularly vulnerable to finding uh, there's more child labour, there's more uh, young people in dead-end uh, jobs in informal employment. So I think um, that, that would be a particularly important one to have a look at in terms of, uh, is, is it going to be a lost generation? When people are talking in the UK about is there going to be a lost generation? I think it's likely to be a lost generation in quite a few other countries. So I think that would be an important one to look at. And obviously it's important to look at within that whether uh, people from different ethnic groups um, have to, are going to have different experiences, be disproportionately affected by this. I was struck by the phrase where you say you've been doing a little bit of research on how IMF lending is such that you have Keynesian Keynesianism for some countries and neoliberalism for other countries. And I was wondering if you could elaborate upon that a little bit. I think for, for countries that. <coughs> actually, the IMF has been encouraging rich countries to have a fiscal stimulus. So we encouraged USA, UK, France, Germany, and it had economists definitely telling them, yes, you know, you, they rediscovered. Uh, the, the wisdom of Keynes in a deep recession because of the paradox of thrift you have to have governments that will spend more money and then you can argue about the precise ways to spend it but in um, low income countries it's been a very different story and it's partly this problem of low income countries uh, that find it uh, hard to raise tax revenue or difficult to uh, finance their deficits and the IMF having what many of us would consider an outdated view, that if you expand government expenditure in a low-income country, it's bound to end up in, with inflation, mm -hmm. or it's bound to be wasted uh, and used inefficiently. Well, there are circumstances when expanding your public expenditure it, it runs the risk of generating inflation, but that's not likely to be the case in a, uh, in a deepening recession. And also, there are ways in which you can um, spend this extra money that would help address um, that would help improve the supply of goods and you have an inflationary risk when you're expanding demand faster than the supply so I've been arguing in, a, in another paper which I, which I can send once I've done a bit more work on it, a proper written paper rather than just a PowerPoint um, that one thing they should think about is expanding public expenditure uh, to support women farmers the women farmers are really, really important in uh, lots of uh, countries in Africa and uh, Central America and other parts of the world. 
and then still not recognised as farmers in their own right, and they're not given the access to extension services, to marketing services, to credit, to technology, and so forth. Uh, and but in those cases where they, where there is some improvement, then you see that they can improve the, the yields that they get from their land uh, pretty quickly, and then that helps address. Uh, these food security issues that were a, an underlying problem that, haven't, that hasn't gone away. So I've been arguing, well, couldn't you let countries sort of expand their expenditure a bit more um, uh, if they put it in, in packages that will really support a smallholder farmers and majority uh, in which women farmers are really, really predominant group but are often not recognized as, as such, still seen as some farmers' wives rather than farmers in their own right because that would improve um, your uh, food supply as well as um, uh, creating income. Um, so there are ways, and, and that I think would, 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 what you need is confidence building measures that if governments are going to, if the rules are going to be changed so governments can spend more, uh, then they will spend it in ways that actually do improve uh, the lives of uh, poor people. Um, so I think focusing on agriculture is one. I think these, I talked about the gender responsive budgeting and, and the support for uh, women elected representatives and women's organizations that act as watchdogs. There are also uh, organizations that include both men and women and particularly look at budgets from some countries, in some countries from the point of view of poor urban people or excluded uh, ethnic minorities. So India is a case in point. Uh, and, and that uh, help to improve the quality of public expenditure. So I think one could try and work along those lines to make the case that, you know, yeah, that's right, there are some date and times when it would be more risky to expend public expenditure and you might be less confident about the way it's going to be spent. Uh, but I think now is the time when the risk of inflation is actually quite uh, low and there are ways of spending the money that, that could be productive. But of course, as humans, you've got a state, <laughs> you've got some kind of functioning um, government. It's much more difficult in, in countries where you, where you are in conflict, obviously. obviously. Yeah. Um, in the, you said that uh, one of the state responses should be like uh, they should increase tax revenue. But I wonder how in the middle of the recession, state can actually do it because it's when they, I mean, all, all um, private, the private sector is really, is, is, is really uh, limited. You're quite business. right to raise that because one of the things that happens in a recession, why your budget deficit goes up is because your tax revenues go down. Yeah. People buy less, so you haven't got so much sales tax, they lose their jobs, they're not paying income tax, although income tax isn't so important in uh, middle income and low income countries, and uh, firms are making less profit. But, um, and that's why you need more spending in the short run, but in the longer run, getting more tax revenue is actually really, really important for being able to service the debts that you've in incurred um, in that short run response of expanding money. And there's some really interesting work being done at the moment by a, a t something called the Tax Justice Network, mm -hmm. um, looking at all the revenue that's lost to governments because of tax havens, which allow uh, companies to evade paying taxes, because of tax holidays, one of the things associated with export processing zones is very often is tax holidays come and produce in the zone and you won't need to pay taxes for 10 years. But there's no evidence that means, that means uh, if, you, if you don't do that, that the, they won't come and the companies play off one government against another. Um, so there's a lot could be done actually and rich countries have got an important role to play in this because a lot of the tax havens are either in rich countries or under the um, supervision or control of rich countries to enable poor countries to get more tax revenue. Um, and I think that will be something that's um, gathering strength. And of course there are completely new kinds of taxes uh, that could be uh, feasibly introduced such as um, taxes on international currency transactions. Um, 
which uh, could be done at the national level or the international level and be a new source of taxes, which would uh, be taxes really on the financial sector in particular. Uh, every time somebody changes money into from one currency into another, and which happens millions of times a day around the world, there's this, just on each transaction a very small tax, um, but that since there are lots of these transactions, could generate uh, quite a bit of revenue. So we might say in the short run that's hard to do that, but in the long run, I think that would be one of the things that would justify spending more money now, because spending more money now does mean increasing the government debt. And you've got to have some notion of how you're going to pay that back later on. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have better way, if you really push up your tax effort by cracking down on avoidance and evasion, and you could do that. There's some estimates of the amount of revenue that governments around the world are losing. Huge amounts because of these uh, tax havens and tax avoidance measures. But to tackle that does need an international effort. It's not something that an individual government can easily do because it all depends on um, international tax law. And, and it's one of the things, that's one of the sort of better things that the G20 had said it would do something about. But we have, and there's been a little bit uh, of movement uh, forward on that, although I think there's a long way to go. Because what we don't want, of course, is levying the kind of increasing tax revenues through levying the kind of taxes that would uh, bear heavily on low income women. So we, we don't want, um, let's increase the VAT on children's clothing in order to generate more revenue is not the kind of re revenue uh, measure that we want to see, but I think um, measures against tax. There's a whole corporate welfare state that we ra rarely hear about because there's all kind of tax concessions for corporations. Uh, that if they didn't have that tax concession and they had to pay tax, the government would get a lot more revenue. And I think it's time to start uh, addressing that. And if there's going to be public expenditure cuts, it should be that corporate welfare that gets cut rather than the, the kind of the welfare measures that, that would be important for low income families. But that, of course, re requires a kind of political organizing, a political force, and it is an area where the interests of rich women, even in poor countries, are not going to be the same as the interests of poor women in those countries. So that's the kind of thing that requires an alliance between men and women across the class boundaries and the, 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 middle, the lower income and the middle income people because um, it will be harder to get an alliance of all women for that because the rich women will not benefit women who own lots of shares or business, big businesses and so forth.